Hello, and welcome to the Freddie Mac Connect, aimed to close faster with one report session. All lines are in listen-only mode. This session is being recorded and will be available following the conference. If you have any questions, please use the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. If you have any technical issues, please use the Q&A box as well and someone will assist you. Lastly, using the handouts icon, you will find links to speaker bios and the presentation deck. With that, I will turn it over to Daniel Miller, Director of Technology, Partnerships and Integration with Freddie Mac. Dan, the floor is yours. Thanks, Imani. If you do just one thing to close faster, this is it. Ordering one asset verification report opens the door to many home ownership opportunities, including ver verifying income and source of funds, employment, and ways to expand access to credit. In this session, you'll learn a lot of best practices and tips to close faster and improve the borrower experience. Now I'd like to welcome uh, my panelists that are joining me today. Louis, uh, please introduce yourself and your role. Thanks, Dan. My name's Louis Perez, Senior Manager and Product Owner on the Loan Products team here at Freddie Mac. My team and I are responsible for developing and enhancing products that automate the capacity assessment. And we use AIM for that. AIM stands for Asset and Income Modeler. So you'll be hearing that a lot today. And this is an LPA capability where we use different sources, such as third-party sources, to assess assets, income, and employment. Thanks, Louis. Christos, please introduce yourself as well. Hello, I'm Christos Betios. I'm the Chief Information Officer of NFM Lending. Um, we are a nationwide originator um, and um, my responsibility carries across the origination systems, our cloud architecture, our data reporting, all electronic assets, and um, the development of solutions, um, including solutions for our origination platform. Um, I've been in the industry for 22 years, um, in the secondary, in the origination market, in the title and closing, um, and uh, for the last seven years, I've been the chief information officer for, for this uh, mortgage originator. Great. Thanks, Christos. Let's dive in. So, uh, Louis, can you explain what's the power of one report? Why is it important and what's the technology behind it? Yes, absolutely. So the power of one report uses AIM, that asset and income modeler, and it uses the asset transaction data from one asset verification report. So basically you, think, you can think of that as bank data to automate several parts of the underwriting process that are required to sell a loan to Freddie. So from just one asset report, you can verify you have enough funds to close. You can assess income from direct deposits in the transaction. You can verify the employment pre-closing to meet that 10-day pre-closing verification using the direct deposit. And we can even assess a borrower's history of managing finances outside of the uh, credit report. So we look at the asset transaction data and specifically we look at rent payment history and borrower cash flow. And we can do all of that based on just one asset report. And that really is the technology, that really is the big piece of the technology here. It could be one and done with several aspects of your mortgage underwriting process. Great, thanks, Louis. Christos, can you speak to NFM's experience with the power of one report and how you're using it today? Of course, um, we have actually um, been using the electronic asset statements for uh, quite some time. Um, for us, it is a critical component of our digital origination strategy um, in that you know it achieves both a better customer experience through more convenient way of collecting um, documentation, but it also um, <clears throat> has delivered for us um, faster closings, simpler closings as well. So. Um, the, these are the two drivers where we decided to rely on the electronic statements from before. I mean, we have seen, in addition to that, um, an increase, a significant increase on the amount of rep and warrants we receive because we rely on the electronic um, bank statements um, at, at the origination process. So three things, faster um, closings, and then we get better customer experience, and then we get better uh, relief from Robin Warren on using this uh, as electronic assets. Great, thanks Christos. Now let's talk about how it works and how to maximize the benefits. 
Lewis, can you explain how the Power of One works as it relates to Freddie Mac's technology? Yes, absolutely. Uh, the good news is that it's pretty straightforward and simple. Uh, the, our customers have to use one of our AIM vendors, and then they order an ASA report as they would normally use for their underwriting. And when they submit to LPA, they'll take that reference number associated with the report and submit that with their LPA submission. And then we do the rest. We automatically assess, uh, as I mentioned before, assets, income, employment, and even those access to credit opportunities, the rent payment history and the borrower cash flow. We automatically do that and then we return the results in the feedback certificate. Then the seller would review the results just like they would today and they can see exactly what we're able to verify with that one report. That's it. It's that simple. Great. Thanks, Louis. So at Freddie Mac, we've observed that the technical integration with LPA and AIM is not that difficult. What takes a little more time and focus is, uh, is really around the operational component. Uh, it can be a challenge. You just need to, to take a little bit of time to, to step through and figure out how it works with your process. That being said, Christos, how did NFM overcome barriers to implementation? How has AIM made the biggest impact to your organization? Yeah, I think for most people who are in the uh, mortgage origination space, they know that one of the most difficult things is change management, right? It's deploying the solutions. So great solutions are out there, but deploying, implementing and adapting solutions is a challenge. Um, it has taken us quite some time to get to the level where we are today um, because, you know, there's so much um, uh, difficulty with people changing the way they've been doing things. So moving from the traditional bank statements to an electronic cash statements collection um, has has been something that we've inched, you know, our adoption over time. And, you know, that can highlight three three areas um, that helped us move there. Um, in, in our loan applications, in our communication, our online app, we have strengthened the language, right? We've made it you know, more explicit for the borrower that this is to their benefit. Um, we encourage them to use electronic asset statements. So we strengthen the language in which we collect the statements. Um, we also um, have built um, metrics um, where we can actually monitor down to the, the region or to the team or to down to the processor level, the adoption, right? To see um, what team is using and not using it. So we actually measure and, you know, we, we can call out folks to say, hey, you know, how come your adoption of electronic statements is lower than others? So we, we monitor this um, on an ongoing basis through um, dashboards. And I, I think the last item um, is, you know, cost, right? For us, it's also savings, right? With the increased expense of various different products out there, um, the fact that we can get our assets and income and employment verification um, through one report and even do the final, as, as Lucas mentioned before, um, it, there's, there's a significant financial benefit, which internally we have been able to develop our own verification of employment and income waterfall, and we've plugged this at the very front of the waterfall. So we've been able to say, hey, you start this way, which has increased our adoption over time. So I mentioned the three things, just to repeat them, right? We strengthen the language for the borrower. Um, we measure and be able to demonstrate that we show the financial benefit, and then we included it in our waterfall for our processors to, to start with that when they, when they do verifications. Hope this answers you. That's great. Now that it's standard procedure at MF NFM, how do you continually optimize the process? Well, I think uh, the, the, the way we optimize it, it's more of a, you know, viral marketing internally. Um, I think, you know, getting more people to share successes. Um, we do videos, we do regular um, uh, training and best practices, communication out there. Um, and, and, and the loan officers become the best cheerleaders sometimes of the product. Uh, when you have a loan officer that is able to um, get a you know a loan switch from a caution to accept because of uh, you know the cash flow uh, or or the rental history that's verified in the electronic statement um, that becomes a big success even for one loan right and so that that
that is um, what we're relying, right, to increase the adoption, the success, sharing the successes with the other team members. And now we'll go to the next piece, which is, Lewis, can you walk us through the various AIM offerings, provide some examples, and how these offerings can help different types of borrower circumstances? Yes, absolutely. So we're going to summarize our different products. We think of this as kind of like Forbes. On the first pillars is the traditional asset verification, what we call our AIM for assets. There we look at, again, that asset report, specifically the checking, savings, money markets, and as of earlier this month in October, retirement accounts as well, and Gibson grants. And we assess whether there are enough funds to close. And if yes, then we offer reps and warrants for the, for the customer for that sufficiency of the assets and the integrity of the data, of course, is coming from a verified source. And of course, the use case there is it's, it's a purchase market. So we've got to verify those assets. The automated way is the simplest and uh, most efficient way of doing it. That'll help the borrower experience, as Christos mentioned. Moving on to income, that's uh, our aim for income using direct deposits. So here we're using the transaction data and we're identifying direct deposits from employment income, like base, bonus, overtime commission, so different in income types there as well as pension, military, even child support, alimony, and VA disability. So we assess that income and we're able to derive a gross income. And if we believe that gross income is enough, then we are able to offer our customers reps and warrants for the calculation, the accuracy of the calculation, and also the integrity of the data. Of course, there the ease of being able to verify your income, which sometimes is the most painful part of the process for a borrower, you can think of all the back and forth if you've uh, done a mortgage recently to be able to uh, verify that income. Direct deposits very cleanly show that in the transaction history, and that's why we're able to do it through the direct deposit. Uh, and then the last, or the third one I should say, is the employment. So as the underwriting progresses and we're getting towards the end, we know we have to verify that the borrower still is employed. That's that 10 day pre-closing verification to use the Freddie speak and we're able to use the asset transaction data, the direct deposits to verify that as well. So that would be a, a refresh of an asset report, asset data, where you would see that employment or even military history. And we would get comfortable with the borrower still being employed if we see a recent direct deposit that's on the expected cadence. So that is replacing the old school uh, picking up the phone and trying to verify that the bar is still employed in kind of a manual way or even faxing a form, emailing a form, um, and it may or may not get to where it needs to go. This is near the end of the process. We want it to be efficient and fast, and doing using the asset transaction data for that is a way to do it. And then our, our, our fourth pillar is our access to credit opportunities. Here we looked at, as I mentioned, the rent payment history and borrowed cash flow. And if we find in the transaction data that we have, consistent rent payment history or positive borrowed cash flow, then that can positively affect the credit risk assessment. So all that, again, with one, uh, with one asset report. Uh, so lots of opportunities for the, our customers as well as the borrowers. Great. Thanks, Louis. Christos, on October 1st, we added gifts, grants, investment accounts as eligible uh, sources of funds and asset types. How are these AIM enhancements going at NFM? We, for, for us, right, the adoption um, is done through um, training, education, and our change management process. We communicate some of this uh, to the loan officers. Um, the, the, the rent payment um, is, is very important for us. 43% of our buyers are first time home buyers. And the fact that we can you know, use the data and get the LPA findings to give us the boost and, you know, in, I guess it, uh, but a third of the cases being able to reverse a caution to, to, uh, <clears throat> to an approved is a significant deal. Um, so, I mean, at this stage, um, I am, I can say what the first time that happened, right? We, we cannot see a happier loan officer that they're able to, to make that, that switch. So currently we're relying on, on the findings and the, the end findings through the LPA, um, to give us <clears throat> those, uh, those, those findings and communicate it to the LO. So we're doing our internal training, make sure people are aware of it. And then um, we constantly try to remind people of the benefits of using electronic assets that people are you know, actually adopting now 
um, on their own. Great. Thanks, Christos. Let's take a little bit uh, closer look at rent payment history and cash flow assessment. Lewis, what are the key opportunities here with cash flow assessment and rent payment history and why? I think key here is to remember that uh, we started, uh, although we started using asset transaction to verify income and employment and assets, it's now become much more than that. We're able to consider the asset transaction data where that normally would not be considered in the credit risk assessment to be able to turn a caution loan, what would be a caution loan, into an accept loan. So if a bar um, or if a uh, asset report is submitted with a loan with that reference ID, we will automatically assess eligible caution loans for both rent payment history and borrower cash flow. And eligible caution loans, I mean loans that would be a caution, but now that we have an extra bit of insight, we can possibly flip that caution to an accept. So I think that is where the key opportunity is because before last year when we uh, uh, unveiled these capabilities, those would stay caution. Now they're able to become accept. And if you submit with the ASTA report reference ID, we're gonna do that automatically for you. And then we'll message you telling you, you got an accept because of the cash flow or rent payment. But we also try to make it very easy to help you spot opportunities. So let's just say there is no ASTA report submitted with the LPA submission. We will message if there is an opportunity for that loan to flip from what, what is going to be a caution to an accept. And the way we do that is that we look at whether these uh, caution eligible loans, if we had that extra insight, could make that flip over to an accept. And then we message, uh, I believe it's FCL0421, my favorite number for messages. Uh, it says that please go get an asset report because your customer could benefit from it. These are loans that basically might go the wayside because they're caution. And now you, can, uh, you have the opportunity to order that asset report and flip those to an accept. And, and key also is that the assessments will never negatively affect the credit assessment. Rent payment history, borrower cash flow, we're looking for the positive and the consistent rent payment history, and it will never negatively affect it, but it can positively affect it. Sounds like a great opportunity. Christos, how are you utilizing these capabilities with rent payment history and cash flow assessment and NFM today? I mentioned before, right, that um, this is something that uh, has uh, is very important to us because of the nature of our borrowers, right? Forty three percent first time home buyers. Um, uh, you'd be surprised the loan officers are now focused on, you know, the the uh, the the caution, the, the eligible um, loans that if you have electronic asset statement. So they themselves are monitoring um, the usage of it. We see that once the loan goes into processing, um, the you know even if the borrower may not have provided electronic statements up front at the loan app, they do uh, the, the the processing and the account team requests that the borrower supports it. So uh, we we've seen maybe a thirty percent pick up on uh, being able to uh, switch the question to an approval using um, the uh, the positive the positive uh, cash flow. And the red payment, so it's um, it's being used as, as the fact that the loan officers themselves now are getting more um, focused on on these benefits. That's great. Let's wrap this up with some key takeaway opportunities for the audience. Christos, what NFM best practices can you share with other lenders? I, I, in, in for, for us, right? Um, this uh, you need to realize that this takes time to increase the adoption to to end up in, in in a place where most of your loans are now done with electronic asset statements, and then you have to constantly educate the folks. Um, uh, again, I mentioned change management is hard. Um, it starts with training through announcements, through uh, recordings, and then uh, you know. The, the probably the most important is share success stories, right? When you have uh, a loan officer who can speak to the power of the of the product, I think it goes a long way better than than the technology or the change management people talking about it. So, uh, share success stories, I think, is is the ultimate. And then I mentioned a couple of other things in my presentation as to how we've now made it part of our waterfall system. So we are 
um, telling people um, that this is the best practice as well, be, be beyond the, the, the borrower providing the statements up front. And Lewis from Freddie Mac, anything more to add? Yes, just a couple of tips. Um, setting the right expectation for the bar, as Christo said, is something that really resonates because it works. Telling them the advantage that they're going to get by giving us access to the asset report is key here. And, and so best practice is when you're having that, common, that conversation, when you have that language, depending on if, if it's you're speaking, if the bar is speaking with a loan officer or not, we want to make sure that the bar gets the best shot at, at, at the benefit. So when they, you want to link as many asset accounts as they as they can so these are transactions excuse me bank accounts where they would have the direct deposits deposited where they have the majority of their savings even their investment accounts where they do their day-to-day -day transactions the more information we have the more opportunity we can give to the bar to take advantage of the asset report so that's a key part there the other one is to uh, look for the messages that message that i mentioned that 421 message is out there and it's firing now if you're submitting an asset report with a, uh, to LPA, and it's telling you that caution loans could be flipped to an accept, please order, please order an asset report. So utilizing that is super important. And remember that uh, because this is so seamless for current uh, customers who use AIM, this is already happening. Uh, you may not notice it, uh, but I, we encourage all customers to take a look at their messaging and to see because we've had conversations with a lot of customers and we'll point out specific loans that are accepts only because of bar cash flow and rent payment history. And, uh, and then there's others that are opportunities, right? That could be flipped over that maybe they're not responding to. So ha it's happening now, take, take a look at those messages. And as Christos mentioned, change management's always tough. It's a journey, I know, but it is worth your while to incorporate these messages in there. Thank you both for sharing. Now, now I'll share some key resources that will help lenders boost underwriting with the power of one report. Check out these resources. We have a variety of learning formats for all things AIM. Thank you, Lewis and Christos, for sharing your insights and best practices today. We hope you all found today's presentation helpful and walk away with some tips and ideas on how to leverage the Asset Verification Report and LPA and AIM to close faster and with high quality. That's all the time for today. Thank you to our esteemed speakers for joining us. We will reach out to you following the conference if you submitted a question. However, your opinion is important. Please take a few moments to take our brief survey so that we can continue to bring you timely and relevant content. Furthermore, the presentation deck will be sent to you following the session. You can also log in anytime after the conference to play back this or any other session. Thank you and enjoy the rest of the conference.